Hello, it's the week beginning Monday the 8th of March and this is Business Unwrapped, a series of bonus podcasts brought to you by Tech UK and the China British Business Council. Across three episodes, we'll be exploring the cultural, legal and ethical questions for British companies doing business with China. And today, for our second episode, we're looking into China's legal system. Tech companies working in China can learn more at the UK government's new website, gov.uk slash digital and tech China. I'm Ollie Mann, and this is Business Unwrapped. And joining me today from the week's digital team is Mr. Joe Evans. Hello, Joe. Hi, Ollie. And our special guest today, Mark Schaub from King and Wood Mallisons. Uh, Mark, you are joining us from a hotel room in Shanghai where you're quarantining. That's right. Thanks, Ollie. Hi. How open is China for business in your experience? And you made a career out of supporting businesses there. Is it growing? Yeah, look, it's growing a lot by leaps and bounds. Uh, I started in China back in 1993 and it was very restricted. You know, there was a, a guidance catalog and it would say what companies you could set up. I would say over the last 30 years, the market access has grown, you know, you know, to a large degree. So if you're in manufacturing, you know, 90% of businesses are free to set up uh, wholly foreign owned enterprises. So you can be 100% owner of the company. Uh, but there is, you know, still companies and sectors which are restricted uh, or even prohibited. And these are often sensitive areas. So, you know, it could be media, social media, uh, internet, uh, education, but it's a small list. So I think for most uh, people listening, their business is unlikely to be restricted or prohibited. Well, speaking of which, Joe, I've tasked you with selecting a news story that uh, helps us illustrate the challenges of uh, running businesses legally in China. What have you got for us? I'm asking if the walls have ears in China's clubhouse. Yeah, in the last week, it has really exploded in China. And I was spending myself hours on the app because it was so amazing to suddenly hear literally these voices of so many people inside China talking about these very sensitive topics that are immediately censored, um, usually in China, if you try to talk about it on any type of Chinese social media platform. So for, for the Xinjiang room, people in China, even people living in Xinjiang it, um, itself was talking about internment camps. Mm. And it was really interesting because they were talking to not only each other in China, but also people in Taiwan, people in Hong Kong, people in Canada and the US. So it was not only an explosion of free speech in China, but also just really brief and vibrant uh, interaction with the world. The Toronto Star's Joanna Chu speaking to CBC News about the social media app Clubhouse causing, as she puts it there, an explosion of free speech in China. Uh, Joe, firstly, for those who may not know, what is Clubhouse? So Clubhouse is a sort of audio chatting app um, that you can sort of drop into and have conversations with people that have signed up all around the world. And it's sort of, it's organised into rooms that discuss certain topics, hence the, hence the Clubhouse name. And this proved popular amongst Chinese users? In China or around the world? Uh, so actually both. But the interesting element of this is that the app actually wasn't meant to be available in China, but people managed to find a backdoor to downloading it. Um, the problem really was that then a report by Stanford Internet Observatory found that the app contains quite serious security flaws that left all of these users' data quite vulnerable to access by the Chinese government. As was mentioned in the clip, people were using it to take part in discussions on topics that are quite sensitive in China, like, as she mentioned, the Xinjiang detention camps, or also Hong Kong's national security law was also being discussed in a room. The problem was that the back end of this app was developed by a company called Agora, um, and the Stanford Internet Observatory found that Agora would likely have access to the raw audio and could potentially provide that to the Chinese government. So I think what really this sort of shows is some of the challenges faced really by companies that are trying to set up in China. Obviously, Clubhouse wasn't necessarily doing it deliberately, but the issue with Agora handing over data and information to the Chinese government really does speak to some of the challenges that tech companies face when setting up in what is obviously an incredibly attractive tech market. One wonders, Mark, whether Clubhouse really did review their data protection practices, you know, in response to this investigation by the Stanford Internet Observatory on the basis that data might be available to the Chinese authorities, or whether really, because people were openly discussing Xinjiang and, and Hong Kong, they thought, well, we might want to base ourselves in China one day, so we don't really want to be encouraging this. So, I, I mean, I think with the clubhouse, it's not really about their data access. That kind of business is not allowed in China, or you would have to follow the Chinese regulations. So, you know, I'm here in, in Shanghai, so I won't be able to access Google. 
I won't be able to access Facebook. So China does have strict restrictions on social media platforms. They have their own social media platforms. And you can use Bing, the Microsoft search engine, because they comply with the Chinese requirements. But Google chooses not to comply with the Chinese requirements. So they're excluded from this market. I and mean, obviously, if you're a tech company thinking about opening in China, Joe, you're going to bring a couple of important things to the party, aren't you? One is obviously your people and your your tech spec and your cutting edge, innovative, you know, infrastructure. But the other is your IP. Uh, and on intellectual property, China is also a market that particularly Western companies feel a bit dubious of. Yeah, and I think a lot of this relates to China's um, national intelligence law. This is the law that kind of gets brought up a lot in relation to companies like Huawei, which obviously is a Chinese company, but kind of has ramifications for everybody. It's basically this suggestion that you could be forced to hand over data to the Chinese government, regardless of where the data came from. And that also requires organisations and also citizens to cooperate with state intelligence agencies on request. Um, which could obviously mean any data that you hold in a company in mainland China could be requested by the Chinese government and it could require you to hand over that information. So it's certainly something from a sort of IP standpoint that that companies need to be aware of if they're going to consider setting up in China. We have seen some pretty big names though, Joe, retreating from China. Uber springs to mind. Why is that? Yeah, you're quite right. Actually, Uber ended up sort of retreating and buying into a Chinese company that was doing a very similar thing. And doing quite well out of it, I must say. (laughs) I'm not saying it was necessarily a bad business decision. No, absolutely. Uber looks set to actually make great gains from that decision to pull out of China. And in, in the long term, their investment looks likely to pay off. And so although you are seeing some businesses retreat because it is a sort of tricky environment to operate in, you know, the days of the sort of, of China being considered, you know, it was dubbed the Vietnam War of American businesses because so many promising young investors sort of went there and ended their careers. And those days really are over. And actually, I think if, if businessmen or people thinking about setting up in China spend too much time looking at the sort of Western see no hostility in the press over politics, I think you could possibly end up with the, slightly the wrong impression about the fact that actually China is very open and receptive to Western investment in, in its sort of emerging spaces. OK, so let's talk about some practical things then, Mark, because we, we discussed last week how if you want to set up an outpost in China, there are some basics that are worth doing from Britain, talking to the CBBC, getting an interpreter, working with Chinese companies, working with numerous regional Chinese outposts, all of that. What about legally? What are the absolute kind of must-dos as you establish yourself? So I think, you know, firstly, it's it's good to talk to your competitors and also have a feel what's actually the case. And so I think the first question is to know yourself, which I understand is not perhaps a legal question, but yeah, you know, what are your capability? What are your resources? Sounds like a Chinese proverb to know yourself. <laughs> yeah, I could start, I could start uh, spouting these off. But I think, you know, very few people fail because of legal reasons. Uber made a decision to leave the market because they couldn't compete in the market. It wasn't like anybody forced them out. So I think first they know what you can do, have the resources. And then I think the second issue is work out the business that you want to do in China. Is it restricted? Like I said, very few businesses are restricted. And then I think the third thing is perhaps know who you're doing work with. If you want to do something which is really you know, facing the whole of the Chinese population and you're really targeting the Chinese consumer, because like 20 years ago, you know, most companies that were going there, they were trying to manufacture cheap for export. Nobody comes anymore for that. So most businesses who are coming, and we're seeing more business come, you know, not less, they're mostly targeting the Chinese consumer. And for that case, very often you need a Chinese partner to achieve the scale, not because of legal reasons. So finding the right partner is important. And then I would also suggest, even though I'm a lawyer, it sounds a bit counterintuitive, try to do a contract which you can understand. So, so many contracts are so convoluted, so esoteric, so complex. You know, I think if you can't understand the contract, there's no way the Chinese guy will understand the contract. So have a clear, straightforward contract that really says what, you know, you want to say. And then thirdly, I think, you know, it's really headquarters needs to be involved. Even if it's a joint venture, you know, headquarter people have to turn up. You have to deal with just the Chinese partner, but also the stakeholders and build the business. A mistake I see from many tech companies is they never engage with the local authorities or anybody else until they have a problem. And then that's the worst time to start a relationship is when you've got a problem. Better to build up the relationship in advance. So, Joe, where are, where have you seen companies getting this wrong? So I think where companies have gone wrong in China is, is essentially where they've failed to jump through the type of regulatory hoops, which are very clearly outlined, but it is just a case of making sure that you're doing the due diligence before you go and set up there. 
you know, a good example of this is GlaxoSmithKline, who were fined £297 million in 2014 after it was found guilty of bribery. But then that's a very good example of the fact that actually, you know, the UK Bribery Act and, and China's anti-bribery legislation are, are not a million miles away from one another. And it's just a case really of doing your due diligence and making sure that you're sort of monitoring your company act activities and ethics in the same way that you would do if you were setting up anywhere else. So it's not necessarily a reason to sort of be terrified of the Chinese market or looking at it and thinking too competitive, too complex. It's more just a case of actually carrying out the same kind of diligence that you would if you were setting up elsewhere. Where is UK law and Chinese law most compatible, do you think, Mark? I don't think there's really that much of an overlap, to tell you the truth. I think, you know, uh, China doesn't have really a, a, a law of precedent. China would probably be more similar to continental Europe type law. It's more statute driven. I think you know, it's easier to say how it's different. So I think uh, judges are, are perhaps not as involved as in the UK. And I think the big issue is in China, the authorities have very, very broad discretions. So, you know, even though, you know, we, we would say that the laws become much more sophisticated, there still is enormous discretion on the part of the authorities. And I think that is something which some businesses find, you know, difficult. And, and that is only, you know, difficult in certain cases. I think in most cases, it's relatively clear cut. Uh, but sometimes if you're pushing the envelope, you know, you can perhaps be on the wrong side of things. And Joe mentioned the UK Bribery Act. What's the significance of that? I can't imagine if we were discussing setting up a business in almost any other country, that would be one of the first things someone might say. So I think, look, um, I think maybe Joe mentioned it because I think the UK Bribery Act uh, has extraterritorial effect. It's also known as one of the laws which was perhaps like a leading law in this. But I think if we're talking about foreign businesses in China, we're mostly concerned about Chinese compliance and Chinese anti-bribery measures. And these are quite, like Joe said, they're quite robust. I think one of the issues is that it's a big market. It's a you know quick moving bar market. Different people have uh, discretions. And I think the issue is there is a um, temptation to perhaps cut corners to get growth. And then sometimes this gets found out and then, you know, you're in trouble. So I think yeah, that's the issue. But I think these things happen in every jurisdiction. So it's not peculiarly Chinese. So you haven't encountered a particular number of companies trying to cut those corners compared to elsewhere? Oh, no, of course we have. No, probably 70% of the foreign companies to some degree cut the corners. Uh, uh, it's just the question of how egregious, you know, so... I, I won't talk about GlaxoSmithKline in, in, in specificity, but you know the pharmaceutical industry is an industry where there's always been a lot of focus because it's big money, it's a lot of public money involved, so that's a focus area. And so the Chinese authorities, they sometimes also do like once a year what they call uh, you know strike hard campaign, and so they may go after a certain type of business or business model. So it is a bit different. You do need to check how it's different. But I don't think anything's capricious. I mean, it all makes sense. It's not like the Chinese authorities just make up something. It's, you know, it's you know how they actually enforce the laws. I wonder if there is a tension then, Joe, between the laws that you do have to go through and tick all the boxes and the speed with which people may want to cut corners or expand globally quickly. Or, you know, I mean, often people look to China to make their manufacturing faster in the first place, don't they? So it's all about speed and the bottom line. And maybe that comes up against getting bogged down in the details. Yeah, I think possibly. But then again, I think that's probably true of business everywhere, really. You know, if you look at what has been going on in the courts in London for the last sort of five or six years, Uber has been dragged through the courts for absolutely ages because the suggestion has been that they have either cut corners or set up a business that sort of exists outside the existing framework for the type of business that it is. Um, so I think that probably is the case. And I think, as Mark says, if you're unfamiliar with the sort of differences between the law in the UK and the law in China, or, you know, even if you are familiar with the sort of more European style of uh, legislation, so we're slightly more familiar with the way that China's legislation works, that would be quite disorientating. And I think that is, again, just another piece of sort of due diligence that's required rather than a reason to be necessarily put off the region as a whole. Um, I think there obviously is also, with the possibility of being kind of dragged into sort of those kinds of um, litigious issues there is also obviously reputational damage to be considered which i think is also something that just generally has to be considered when you're entering the chinese market you know it's very difficult to have a conversation about western companies doing business with china without bringing up things like what has happened what is currently happening in, in xinjiang with um, with the uyghur muslims 
And I think that is also very worth bearing in mind and actually should be a kind of a concern that companies take into account. And is another thing that we've seen, obviously, Huawei is a state-owned company, so slightly different circumstances. But obviously, we have seen their, um, their reputation somewhat damaged by suggestions that their technology is being used to identify Uyghurs and, and that, those kinds of things. So I think reputational damage is also something well worth considering. And a lot of Western companies, I guess partly because of the way China is portrayed in the media and partly because of, you know, real situations that are going on in the news that Joe alluded to, a lot of Western companies just wouldn't trust a Chinese company like they might trust another company from the West. They might be happier to do a deal on a handshake with another Western company. Is that fair, do you think? I, I don't think it's I, I don't think it's really that fair because, look, I think, you know, um, I've been in China for a long time and um, nobody has, you know, really cheated me ever. And I think, you know, there is misunderstandings and there is that cultural difference, but I don't think there inherently there's an issue there. I think the problem is uh, people don't put enough time into the relationship and the contracts are not clear. And, you know, this is a strange point. It may be difficult for people to, to grasp, but often people are very fearful of China and the Chinese people want to do a the Chinese side wants to do the deal, and then the foreign side will have requirements in the contracts, which actually practically legally they'll never be enforceable. And so the problem is when you have a problem. So you know I think most people they only read the contract once, which is just before signing, and then it goes into a drawer until there's a dispute, and then they read it, and then we really will have a problem because sometimes people will get that contract out, and there's a you know, there is something in the contract, but actually it doesn't work in practice. And the foreign side says, well, it's in the contract. And the Chinese say, well, it's not possible. And that's the problem. So that's not an easy contract to draft. So, you know, you have to be able to understand what is actually feasible. You know, don't just be, you know, thinking of some ivory tower. Oh, we'll get the Chinese to buy our shares or yeah, yeah. these things you have to work out something in the contract which is feasible, not just one-sided. All right, thank you very much. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Mark Schaub from King and Wood Mallisons and our very own Joe Evans. This series of Business Unwrapped is brought to you by Tech UK and the China British Business Council. For more information about the opportunities and challenges of working in China, visit china.theweek.co.uk. And for the latest UK government advice, gov.uk slash digital and tech China. Next week on Business Unwrapped, the ethics of business in China, from human rights to managing your reputation. How can you maintain best business practices whilst reassuring your customers? Uh, Plus, each Friday you'll find me hosting The Week Unwrapped, three news stories that may have passed under your radar, discussed and debated by our team. Just search for The Week Unwrapped on your podcast app of choice and click subscribe to get that, and these bonus episodes will drop into your feed as well. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby. Our producer, Sophie King, at Rethink Audio. Until next time, bye-bye.